guys, Brad here. Jim Jam here. Eleven South Mysteries here again for another spooky, spooky time. Yes. Yep. Yep. A little bit two week hiatus in between these videos, roughly. Um, give a shout out to our sponsor, Halloween Hollow. Check out. Check out. Yep. Go ahead. No, no, no. William Wisp. Check out TennesseeHorror.com. TNHorror.com. Yeah. Um, all your haunted house spooky needs. Yes, we have a. I need to update it, but we have a haunt uh, directory on there. And he has realized that there's a lot of haunts out there. Yeah, when I started that, I was God. There's only like five in Tennessee. He's probably just like five over the count. Yeah, there's a, there's actually a lot of haunts all around the world or the country. It's not really big in the world. No, uh -huh. Puerto Rico's in there. You got Canada. You got some in Britain. They do it differently. Yeah, they don't celebrate Halloween like we do. But like Universal, like Japan, they do Halloween. They, they, they do. They have a Halloween experience, but it's like a forty, like you wear VR, and like somebody like like you're tied down to the table. They stick a syringe in you, and so they they poke you with a stick. Um, it made me think of the Halloween Horror Nights thing that's coming to Las Vegas. It's a year-round haunt. They tried that before. All right, Las Vegas. So they tried it again. It was called and something else then. Because they're trying. I guess they're going to try to throw the Halloween Horror Nights name on. It supposedly took you through the process of death. Is what it was called or something like that. Yeah, it was pretty intense. It didn't seem to come on. Would you go to the? Well, depending on what it is, would you do a Halloween Horror Nights? What? Which this would be cool because if they incorporate like they do on the in Hollywood and Orlando. You know the theme haunts year round, maybe each month. I don't know how it works. I don't know if they're gonna have multiple houses. There's gonna be one house with one theme, but uh, it'd be cool if there's multiple houses like they do at the parks, and it's just year round. And maybe every month they change them up. That's gonna be crazy. They're gonna be busy. That's gonna be crazy. They'll probably more than it's busy itself. Yeah, you can't scamp on them tickets, can you? <laughs> no. no. Which we bought the tickets that you could use all month. You can go daily if you wanted for the whole month. And we went, oh, this is. Tommy Horn, I. If you go and you don't live there, buy the Frost Pack stuff. Fuck well, yeah. Because you will only see one or two haunts a night if you don't. It's just too damn much. Too many people talking lines, you know, you're. Stands because so many people coming through, the actors' voices will be shot. You know, first night. So they have. So they have scares. Yeah, they have like it's called speaker scares. They hit a button, the light goes off, sound goes off. You act with sound. So they have enough actors that they have forty five minutes on, forty five minutes off for their entire cast. Oh yeah, you can watch as you're waiting in line, robed actors walking in. Yeah, they got shifts of people like like you said, forty five minutes. They swap them out. Which, could you imagine trying to interact with the kind of interact with that many people for how what was it, how they long though for like two in the morning, I think something like that from mm -hmm. seven to two. That would be tiring. Yeah, and they, especially if they didn't have the speaker scares. Yeah, I mean, I get it. The speaker scares have a purpose, especially in that. But that takes it out for me i'm not I, I guess i'm more like i like more like the home home old school haunt type ways i'm not a big mainstream haunt type person just takes me out of it when i notice i really notice quickly that the scare the sound was coming from above and not towards me and i was like come on here yeah it works it works in certain aspects but it's they look cool all their scenes look cool Oh yeah, they was universal. They had tons of money. Yeah, you know they probably don't put a lot back into it. Probably not, because they, they pay people a lot of money to do this. Oh, you think they get paid more than fifteen an hour? They get paid good money to do it. Well, would you be an actor at the Halloween Horror Nights haunt? I would hate it. <laughs> well, I would absolutely hate it. You don't get time to really. Reset. You're just constantly. I can't see people boogers. I don't like it. Yeah. I don't know how uh, uh, Dingleberry would do a Halloween Horror, a Halloween horror Night. 
No, Dingleberry just looked at me like he wanted to just get this. Yeah, if this was playing butt crack, just fine, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Dingleberry is getting some uh, upgrades that, you know. I'm getting I got, I got a Dingle, new Costco. I got Dingleberry some upgraded CWs. Nice. Yeah. Erica, Erica approved them. Shout out, Erica. <laughs> <laughs> is she with you when you bought the upgrades? No. But she gave me direction and okay. it made sense. So I went with it. But it's, uh, it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be a great time. Just trying to make them uniform for everything. Give them some gags. What are you going to you get a dingleberry pouch to sew onto it? That's it. I have so many ideas. I'm going to get one more than that. Well, if you oh. want to know, then come out and see me, Howlin' Holler. This year and all of it. Feed you some boogers. Did you actually want boogers, didn't you? We'll see. Are they like booger candy? We'll see. <laughs> Maybe you can eat a booger and it tastes good. Yep. Shout out to William West, though. Good friend of mine. Uh, putting her name out there. Uh, if you like to watch people play video games and shoot people in the dick in Call of Duty, that's the guy to just watch. Uh, just one dick. Him, him and his friends uh, just messing around, having a good time. That's always fun. Sometimes, you know, I watch him. I go to sleep. Pass out watching him. It's kind of weird. But it gives him a lot of watch time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're going to get into one this week. Uh, this one is a big one in Nashville. This one is known to take Nashville's virginity, in my opinion. Um, this one is a big, big one. Uh, took, took Nashville's innocence. So this one is the murder of Marsha Trimble, also known as the Girl Scout murder in Nashville. And what's crazy is you're talking about this, it is Girl Scout cookie season. My daughter's Girl Scout cookie or Girl Scout troop is actually doing their last Girl Scout cookie booth tomorrow. Yeah. They're out there in Groves. I have a whole trunk full of Girl Scout cookies if you want any before you leave. <laughs> no, <laughs> I do not need any. Um, so Marshall Trimble was a nine-year-old girl who disappeared on February 25th, 1975. She was delivering Girl Scout cookies to a neighbor in the affluent neighborhood of Green Hills. Green Hills is uppity. Oh, big time rich neighborhood. Yeah, and it still is today for the most part uh, in Nashville. Um, so she went missing. Um, you know, she went out. She's gonna go to the neighbors to deliver some cookies or get money for cookies that the neighbor already bought. The neighbor came home, saw her coming, went inside to get a check written for the cookies. And by the time she got out, the girl was not there. Hmm. Okay, the neighbor did see her talking to a kid and another male that was wearing a hoodie, I believe, green in color um, at the time. So, her body was discovered 33 days later on Easter Sunday near near her home. She had been sexually assaulted. They found that she was sexually assaulted. So, between the time of her disappearance and the time of her body being discovered, they had helicopters out. I mean, this is Green Hills, Nashville. White little white girl, Girl Scout cookies went missing. They canvassed the crap out of this area. Yeah, and they didn't just look for an hour and stop looking. They kept looking. Oh yeah, yeah. Usually, you know, that's you said the uppity neighborhood, so they're gonna go all out for, you know, this. Yeah. So, uh, so she disappeared while just every squirrel cow cookies in Green Hills. The disappearance was investigated by local and state police. The Federal Bureau of Investigation soon joined the investigation due to the possibility of a kidnapping. Trimble's body was discovered more than a month later. It was found that she had been sexually assaulted before being killed. Investigators searched the neighborhood, believing it likely that the murder was a local residence. Now this this case ruined she she was murdered and it ruined another life in my opinion. 
So police attention soon focused on 15-year-old Jeffrey Womack, who lived near Tremble, um, and was one of the last people to see her alive. The kid that they saw her talking to, or the yes, okay. So Marsha had become had come to the Womax house the day of her disappearance. Womax said her, that he had sent her away because he did not have money to buy cookies. He said that after he learned that the girl's disappearance, he went to her house to tell police there what he knew. According to Womack, the police aggressively questioned him and then had him empty his out his pockets. Inside his pockets, police found a half roll of pennies, a $5 bill, and a condom. This seemed to contradict Womack's testimony that he lacked the money to pay Marsha. Well, to be fair, he probably didn't want to. He probably didn't want no cookies and just didn't want to spend the money yeah. on them. But you know. He was turning her away without being rude. Yeah, there you go. The condom suggested to police that he may have sexually abused Marsha. Womack later said... It was a used condom. So, so Womack, this went like Womack was hiding something. Yeah, yeah. And Like, I'm not defending this guy. He was hiding something, so he had a condom. Womack later said that he had the condom because he was, try, he was having a sexual relationship with a local woman who, turns out, was 32. Hey! At the time, you know, I guess that's, uh, that's bad. He was, he, was, he was hiding that, which I get. Yeah, he's you know he he was banging the neighbor's wife probably or <laughs> something. Yeah. So. According to Woman, his mother and the neighbor found out that the police were questioning him and insisted that any further interrogation must be done with a lawyer present. Reporter, Demetria Kalamadimos. Oh, hello. Demetria Yeah, I haven't watched her growing up. Okay, good. News too, I think. Believe that Womack's decision to call a lawyer made police even more suspicious of him. They felt that an innocent person that no need of a lawyer would have no need of a lawyer. Womack's attorney, John Hollins, advised him to stop cooperating with police after that. Womack refused to discuss discuss the case with either the police or the media. Unable to con- to obtain a confession, the police resorted to other means to gather evidence against Womack. When Womack was 17 years old and working as a busboy in a restaurant, the police sent in another color officer into the restaurant to befriend him. But they did not get any incriminating evidence. Womack passed two polygraph tests in 1980. Authorities finally arrested him for Marshall Trimble's murder but the charge was dismissed for lack of evidence. Many police officers involved in the case continue to believe that he was guilty. DNA samples were taken from semen. Okay, trigger warning. DNA samples were taken from semen collected from Marsha's body. But they but these samples were stored improperly and deteriorated over time, mm. limiting investigators' ability to identify or exclude suspects. Police content collected for DNA samples from 96 suspects, including Womack, but none of these samples match the DNA found in the scene. Wow. So, trigger warning. The semen was not found on clothing. The semen was found inside Marsha's body. Yeah. Semen also was found on her clothes as well. Investigators believe Marsha had been lured into, so they found her body in a garage, and this is a garage that it wasn't like organized. It was like she was covered up with a pool, a kid's pool in the corner, and that she has been there the whole time that she was missing. Like she wasn't just like recently placed there when they found her. You think it took place there? Yeah. So investigators believe Marsha had been lured into a garage and killed there. Her body was found fully clothed next to bags of fertilizer in the garage. Despite having been deceased for a month, there was very little de- decomposition due to the cool, dry environment. The cause of death was determined to be strangulation because Marsha had suffered a broken hyoid bone in the neck. Police found it difficult to determine how many people were involved in the crime. They believed the perpetrator was a juvenile and someone Marsha knew. Dirt 
that was found on her shoe was mainly upon the sole, indicating that she had walked into the garage and not been dragged into it. So you think they was trying to buy cookies or use that to get her uh, lure her in? Yeah. So semen was found on the girl's blouse and pants, but not on her underwear. Semen was also found inside of her vagina. But there was no other sign of rape or penetration. Investigators believe Marsha's attacker was either an adolescent boy or a man with a very small penis. DNA tests seem to indicate that there was semen that there was semen from as many as four different attackers. One investigator doubted this because the samples have been poorly preserved and stated, I'm not confident in the DNA sample that we've got. Nashville homicide detective Tommy Jacobs said. Theories okay. proceed. Okay, I gotta just bring this up. So how do they... Why does he even bring in the, the factor of a small penis? Because... I would say because something was still intact. Oh. So... We can um, move on. <laughs> yeah. So... This this is go a little bit back. So they 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 went with this Womack kid, and kind of did they measure? They they've, they've harassed him yeah. from 1975 until he was tried. They actually tried him for this, so that made him difficult in getting a job, getting in a relationship, anything like that. Because he's known now because the public and the the media has already said that they've arrested him for it. So people are automatically assuming he did it. Oh yeah. You know. And he didn't. All right. So these are some theories that the investigators perceived. In 2001, a local paper interviewed police captain, Mikey Miller, former homicide detective Tommy Jacobs of the Nashville PD, and former FBI agent Richard Knudsen about the unsolved Trimble case. Each had a different theory about what happened on the evening of the Trimble disappeared. Captain... Miller said that while Trimble was killed in the garage where she was found, that may not have been where she was sexually assaulted. Uh, about the garage. Mm -hmm. Everything I've read, the garage was searched for her after her disappearance but before her body was found. They almost found it about a month later. But they found it 33 days after she disappeared. But they, they searched the garage before the 33 days. Weird, right? So, would it make sense for the four different semen samples? Okay. Well, four different. Said, yeah, they said that earlier they said that there were four different, could have been up to four different People? DNA samples. I'm not going to say Miller that. Said, Captain Miller said that while Trimble was killed in the garage where she was found, that may not have been where the sex, she was sexually assaulted. Miller thought that Trimble might have been sexually assaulted at a tree nursery, which became part of the investigation. Citing DNA evidence, uh, he also believed that she was sexually assaulted by up to three boys. Three boys that had little wee wees. Jacobs was not sure that Marsha left her home to deliver cookies to Mary Maxwell, which is right across the road from her. That's the one that went in for the check. He suggested she might have been planning to meet up with Womack. Jacob said he thought that someone Marsha knew lured her into the garage. He did not know it was Womack or just an adolescent teenager with his hormones blitzing. Quote. Well, you know what's crazy? I never thought about raping nobody when I was that young. Yeah. Or any time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The suspect just raped someone. It was probably a new experience for him, and it was a new experience for Marsha. It was a tense situation. Marsha screamed, I don't think the perpetrator wanted to kill her. I think he wanted to gain control of her and make her be quiet. In contrast to Miller, his former boss, Jacobs did not believe that Marsha was sexually assaulted by more than one person. Man, just that's an SMH moment. This whole thing is SMH. It's like, what the fuck? Really? Yeah. Yeah. The FBI's notes impose a different theory. So obviously, if there's more than four, what uh, four samples? Obviously, it's more than one person. Yeah. Because what? It would get it would get graphic if I said what I 
what the, they're insisting that like what is it, three other dudes coming there and them you know handle their business own the body or something see it makes sense why they said the nursery because there's a nursery near Pawnee. yeah a tree nursery so the fbi's agent posed a different theory he said that marcia had walked to marie maxwell's house as a woman was pulling into her driveway given the timing marcia could not have known that Maxwell was returning home unless someone had called to tell her. Just minutes earlier, Maxwell had parked her car in front of the neighbor's driveway to ask a quick question. The house was across the street from the Womack and Morgan homes. If Jeffrey Womack was home during that time, or if he was at Peggy Morgan's house, he could have seen Maxwell's call, car and called to Marsha. Knudsen played, placed Womack at the driveway with Marsha. Remember, she says she saw people in the driveway. Yeah. The three investigators series varied widely, but they concluded that whoever killed Marsha most likely was a juvenile who lived in the neighborhood. Okay. So, just kind of go into this. The impact on Nashville. Residents were upset by the fact that the victim was a trial and that the crime took place in this neighborhood, which is a high-class neighborhood. This was at the time when people felt that their children were safe. The delay in finding and recovering the girl's body also disturbed people. FBI agents were brought in to assist in the investigation. All right. After Womack's release in 1980, residents continued to be haunted by the unsolved murder each year Nashville's media highlighted the story on the anniversary of Marsha's disappearance or of the discovery of her body. The case marked a time of great change on how media was covered by local media, how news was covered by local media. And in the emergence in, in the emergence the emerging importance of DNA evidence. All right. And then the Nashville police captain in 2001 said in that moment, Nashville lost its innocence. Our city has never been and never will be the same again. Every man, woman, and child knew that if something that horrific could happen to that little girl, it could happen to anyone. So, we, Jerome Womack has been let go mm-hmm. of, of charges in this case. Yeah. He had a condom and he was banging somebody's, somebody's wife, probably 32-year-old. You know, yeah, neighbor's so, lonely, lonely yeah. wife. Yeah. So they 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 they're trying to get the puzzle to fit easily. It's not where, it's not like this is, form. in my opinion, this is bad police work. Work because her body was never moved. Like she was in that garage, and they searched that garage. How did they not find her body? She was just covered up in the pool, like a little kiddie pool. That's it. They just glanced over it. Is what happened. Oh, you know, no, no. her. So now we're going to get into the person who really did it. On June 6, 2008, a Davidson County grand jury indicted 16 year old Jerome Sidney Barrett, charging him with first degree murder and felony in the case of Marsha Trimble. Barrett had formerly been indicted and convicted for more assaults against women and children. At, that, at the time of Marsha's murder, Barrett was working in her neighborhood. All right. Barrett first took responsibility for the 1975 murder during a private conversation on the rooftop of the Davidson County Criminal Justice Center. During questioning, he said he did not rape her. He killed her. He said his DNA was on her but not in her. Barrett once again claimed to have killed Marsha immediately after he had an altercation with another jail, jail inmate. It was during this altercation the convict said that Barrett claimed to have killed four blue-eyed bitches. In quotes, journalists revealed that for more than a decade, investigators had concealed the fact that DNA evidence excluded numerous neighbors as potential suspects. A retired police detective admitted that the men were excluded and they had and they had not been told of the fact in the early years of the investigation the use of dna evidence was new and investigators did not 
thoroughly understand its implications. Investigators were not sure the DNA evidence was conclusive or excluding suspects. In addition, detectives admitted to carelessly handling Marsha's body, stating that they simply cut her blouse and pants off in the shed without wearing protective gloves. Hmm. So, here's Barrett's record, the guy who did it. Sarah Des Prez, a Vanderbilt student, was murdered about three weeks before Marsha Trump. Metro's cold case units were able to apply new DNA analysis to evidence from the Des Perez murder to bring charges against Barrett. At the announcements of the arrest of Barrett, police suggested that he might have murdered Marsha. The police said that, Mar that Barrett's whereabouts and crimes during the period of Marsha's murder had placed him under increased scrutiny. On February 17, 1975, a Belmont student was raped in Nashville. Jerome Barrett was arrested in March of 1975 in connection to this crime and was convicted of it a year later. Barrett had been in jail on March 12, 1975, 15 days after Marsha's disappearance, until after Marsha's body was found. On December 3, 2007, Nashville television stations reported that DNA recovered from the Trimble crime scene matched that of Barrett. Advances in DNA testing enabled a match between crime scene evidence and Jerome Barrett, a 60-year-old Memphis man with a criminal record of sexual assaults on gro uh, both grown women and children. So. So Jerome Barrett. So the, the, after he uh, admitted to killing, they never looked into. Well, he, he there was this, it was on News Channel Five Plus whenever I was in school in two thousand eight. Uh, search him. So Jerome, but well, this whole case was on. You can watch. You can probably watch it on News Channel Five Plus. First one. Her? Yep. It's him. Wow. Alright. You want to show this? Yeah. So here's, um, here you go, right here. Here's, who Jerome Barrett is. There you go. Right there. That's Jerome Barrett. That's Marcia Trimble on the left. Nine years old. So, yeah, he got sentenced. I think he was already serving a lot of sentence. What was that again? Is it set up? In June 2008, a 60-year-old man named Jerome Barrett was finally apprehended for the little girl's murder, although he only admitted to killing and denied any charges of sexual assault. You know, if you were going to prison for a long time, too, you'd probably do the same thing, I'm sure. Yeah, because you don't want to get, well, even with a child murder, but you don't want to get, you know, uh, they say they have a lot worse than a child rapist and rapist period. Okay. In July 2009, at the age of 62, Jerome Barrett was convicted and sentenced to spend 44 years in prison, although Marsha's mother, Virginia Trimble Ritter, had endured almost four decades without seeing the crime scene photographs of her deceased daughter and was advised by police and her partner she recently conceded and decided to view them for herself. The pictures were apparently so graphic that she broke down screaming, if I had a gun, I'd kill him. I remember when I mean, Channel 5 Plus. They didn't show the picture, did they? No, they showed the the court, the, the whole thing. You know, on the... They showed the picture of the body? News Channel 5 Plus, they do the, like, the big cases. They like, go live in Portland. Well, I'm not looking at it. Even though that's pretty devastating to see. Do they have that on here where you can find it? You can see pictures of the garage. So let's see if we can find where her body was found. 
We're trying this. The body's from right here. She was last seen here. There's her house. Like not far at all. So this is about where, so this is the Trimble house. She was last seen here getting the cookies to the neighbor, right? And then that is the garage and where she was found. So close. They searched that garage after she disappeared and didn't find her body. But her body was always there, they said. It's a damn shame, you know, that no one... I'm wondering if, like, this bear... Because they, they had all the locals looking, too. I wonder if this bear guy was one of the searchers and actually searched her and said it was clear, but it wasn't. Hmm. Yeah, that would be pretty wild. But this dude's a piece of shit. Big time. Took Nashville's innocence. Girl Scout took his just changed it. We're doing another life. Like, poor Jeffrey Walton. Get a picture of him. Like, he's... I don't want to look at Dahmer. That's a sick son of a bitch, too. I need more pictures of him. I'm in Nashville. Yeah, right there. That's him? Yeah, two victims because they pushed it on him. One murder, two victims. So you got Marsh Trimble on the left, and then Jeffrey Womack on the right, which they really, really did destroy his life. Yeah, we already discussed all that, what happened, so, but yeah, that's him right there. Definitely look into this one more. I mean, if you're a Nashvilleian, it's kind of an important one. Yeah, you know, you know our first episode, we... Paul Dennis Reed, piece of shit. Yep. Fast food killer. Well, I hope you enjoyed these last four. Because uh, next time you see us, uh, we will be wearing different clothes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you want to uh, talk about something in your neck of the woods or any ghost stories or anything, make sure you comment, subscribe, throw the thumbs up, help the algorithm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I I don't know what else to talk about. This is like the the big ones in Nashville for me. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll have to you know spread it out because we are south, but well, we can do it anywhere. We just, mm -hmm. just call. I mean, what do y'all think about the Atlanta child murders? That that one. Yeah. That's a that one's that one's gonna be. Shit. I'm on thirty the thirty victims at least. Like that's gonna be crazy. There's a, in the title of the podcast. We so. could do the tour. We could go live. And you can actually do the tour, the self-guided tour of some of the victims from the Atlanta child murders when they found them, where they went missing. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fun to do a little mm -hmm. road trip, you know, uh, of course. Uh, That's all get, that rando nautica app. We can get a gorgeous school to tag along. Yeah. I'm not getting in the back seat again, though. I don't know. We'll figure <laughs> something out, a bigger ride or something. Yeah, that's a, that might be a... No, that'd be a passenger seat. You in a passenger seat and the ghouls in the back. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, like, we can, you know, my mom said one, but I'm not told her she has to comment. There's a, uh, when we was at Conduga, a guy told us about something in, uh, in Atlanta, in Georgia, of, uh, it was a, it was a doctor's, uh, old mansion that's apparently really haunted, which would be cool to check out. But it's all tore down now. I don't mess with the haunted shit. <laughs> Nope. <laughs> that did. I did. I did not go live. My phone was dead. I got a new phone though. Okay. 
but my other phone died, and I did go to the McDonald's at Paul Dennis Reed to have that time. Oh, really? Well, not nice, that situation, but yeah. 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 Well, so that uh, does it for these, uh, this whole uh, series. series of uh, episodes. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, whatever you want us to talk about, comment. Would this be season two? <laughs> kind of. Season 1.5. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, I uh, hope you enjoyed all these. Uh, like you said, uh, leave us comments and let us know what you think we should talk, uh, what we should cover next. Um, check out tnhorror.com. Be sure to follow Halloween Hollow on uh, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. And there's HalloweenHollowHaunt.com, right? Yep, HalloweenHollowHaunt.com. Uh, big things happening there. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, yeah. Be look out for the Horror Basement Boutique. Yeah. We'll be at full moon. Well, by this time this one comes out, it'll be maybe. Yeah. Easter, if, yeah, though, right? yeah, somewhere around there. If, if it's already passed, oops. <laughs> but we will be in August. We will be at CreepyCon in Knoxville. Nice. So, yeah. All right. We'll see you later. Right there. Look, Carol. Right there. Yeah. I, I, I don't, don't want... <laughs> <laughs>